So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this first uh, side event of the Conference of the State Parties to the Amended Convention of the Fiscal Protection of Nuclear Material. I'm Chris Hobbs, Professor of Science and International Security at King's College London and Programme Director for the UK's Nuclear Security Culture Programme. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event and thanks for turning up um, so early on a, on a Monday morning. So we've got 75 minutes uh, to discuss the topic uh, of next generation reactors, looking at both nuclear security and safeguards considerations. We've got an esteemed panel here of speakers uh, who are going to talk between five and eight minutes, uh, offer their different international perspectives on this topic. And then we're going to have hopefully about 20 minutes or so for questions. And we've got an audience here in the room. Uh, obviously, we've also got people dining in online, including one of our speakers. Uh, but before we kick off on the substantive sessions, I'd like to pass over to Ollie Housden, uh, Deputy Director for Non-Proliferation at the UK's Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, the sponsor uh, of this programme and this side event, who's going to give some opening remarks. Ollie, over to you. Chris, thank you. And it's, it's great to be here on a, on a very sunny morning here in, in Vienna, although I'm not sure I'm going to, be able to see a huge amount of it today, unfortunately. Um, but thank you, uh, uh, Chris. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here to deliver some opening remarks on behalf of the UK government uh, at this first side event of the conference. As head of the UK delegation, I'll be delivering our national statement later today. Uh, and I'm very pleased to see the conference kicking off with an event that showcases our contribution to an increasingly important part uh, and topic of nuclear security. And I'm very glad we'll hear from speakers uh, from the World Institute for Nuclear Security and the Nuclear Threat Initiative, reflecting the shared nature of these emerging security challenges and the vital expertise that civil society uh, provide in tackling them. This event and the research by King's College London that underpins it forms part of the UK's Nuclear Security Culture Programme. This uh, programme, as, as Chris noted, has been funded by department uh, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy since 2014. Uh, and in that time, the programme has made countless contributions to capacity building work on nuclear security around the world. To name just a few, we have trained many hundreds of nuclear security practitioners, fed into IEA technical guidance, developed cutting edge handbooks and policy briefings, and of course, participated in major international events such as this one. Nuclear security culture is, of course, one of the fundamental principles of the ACPPNM, and the UK government continues to see it as a pressing priority. And as we look to the future, we're keen to keep building long-term relationships with partner organisations and countries, supporting them to assess their own security cultures, which make lasting changes over time. And we're glad to have such a successful and sustained working relationship with King's College London, uh, as well as their delivery partners, uh, de delivery partners, pardon me, in Amport Risk and Nuclear Transport Solutions. And while I'm here, I'd like to uh, put in a word for other UK conferences, uh, conference side events sponsored by the UK. On Wednesday morning, we'll have a talk from UK policy, uh, our UK policy lead on cybersecurity for the nuclear sector. The UK is preparing to publish a national strategy on this subject, uh, and I know it'll be very topical and useful discussion. Later on Wednesday, we will have the National Nuclear Laboratory and Nuclear Transport Solutions running an event on attracting and retaining the next generation of nuclear security professionals. The UK firmly believes that creating a diverse and inclusive nuclear security workforce is in all of our interests and hearing from speakers with first-hand uh, first experience will be thought-provoking, I'm sure. And just finally, I'd like to close with a nod to what happens beyond the conference. We all know that advanced nuclear technologies are bringing new security considerations with them. And in the words of the ACP uh, PVNM, they are a major feature of the prevailing situation. As these technologies continue to develop and evolve, so too will the security risks and our approach to mitigating them. And that's one of the reasons why the UK believes it's essential not to let this conference be the only opportunity for state parties to come together and review the convention as amended. So we support the proposal to hold another conference of parties in five to seven years time. And we have submitted a note for Baal to the IEA requesting this. We will other, uh, encourage other state parties who, don't, who haven't yet done so to join us. And I think there's a stand outside the US delegation room 
where you can add your country to the list. That seems like an appropriate note for me to end on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Great. Thanks very much, Ollie, for kicking us off. And now I'd like to turn to our first two speakers, uh, Dr. Ross Peel, Research and Knowledge Transfer Manager at King's College London, and George Foster, uh, Director of Amport Risks, one of the NSCP's consortium partners. Uh, Ross and George are going to take us through some of the key findings uh, from the new research report into this topic uh, that we've just released through the programme. So Ross and George, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today, be it in person or online. Myself and my colleague George will work through the publication that you see in front of you. So those who are in the room will have a copy on your desk. It looks like this. Those who are online, we will share a link with you at the end of this presentation so that you can view a copy yourself. Could we have the next slide, please? So in the next few minutes, we're going to try and run through very briefly um, the overall structure of this report and some of the key conclusions. But we started from the position of what are the drivers behind uh, the move towards novel advanced reactor designs and deployments. And these include uh, things like a desire for re reliable and secure energy supplies, which are independent of uh, foreign interference, the move towards low carbon power sources and the versatility of deployment options offered by novel advanced reactors. There are also cost implications. So these things are supposedly going to be lower cost per kilowatt hour, and they're also going to be affordable compared to large conventional nuclear power plants, although still relatively expensive. Could we have the next slide, please? So this, uh, sorry, one back. There we are, that's it, thank you. So these drivers create a range of opportunities in how we deliver nuclear security, safeguards, and indeed safety. Now, it's our conclusion that the principles behind safeguards and security remain the same. The underlying methods by which we determine security and safeguards requirements are unchanged, but a range of novel technological solutions exist now for how we can deliver these in new ways to bring benefits. The challenge we see though is that security and safeguards are still being delivered in the way they always were um, and that a range of developers and even operators are looking at security and safety um, as, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, security and safeguards as things to be resolved later in the design process once safety and operational considerations have been addressed. And it's our argument that actually a holistic consideration of all four elements together, safety, security, safeguards, and operational factors will bring a range of benefits. Could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So we identify a range of differences between large conventional nuclear power plants and novel advanced reactors. And you can see some of these differences listed on the slide there, and we'll talk through each of those uh, in a little more detail in a moment. But it's clear that each of these will create a set of unique and novel security and or safeguards challenges and considerations. And that all stakeholders, including developers, operators, the IAEA, national governments and regulatory bodies will have to come together to address these issues. Uh, it cannot be done by each organization working independently. Could we have the next slide, please? So the first of these uh, difference areas, which I'll talk about before handing over to George, is the fact that uh, many of these designs are meant to be smaller with a lower power output. And this creates the possibility for factory-based manufacture and transport to sites as installation. Um, now, it's clear that if we're going to be manufacturing much more complete nuclear energy systems in factories and transporting these, this creates a increased uh, attractiveness to threat actors. And it's gonna be important to ensure that nuclear, uh, nuclear equipment manufacturing facilities are appropriately secured, especially if fueling the, the reactor at the point of manufacture. And then these things are transported in a secure way, uh, taking novel technological approaches to transport security. So I'll now pass over to George to talk about some of the other challenges. Thanks, Ross. Um, this imperative to reduce capital and operating costs comes with challenges and opportunities. But the drive to achieve cost efficiencies in security and safeguards will be best achieved through early design integration. The fact is that security personnel costs are large for large conventional nuclear power plants. And in the West, these might be typically in the range of 8 to 10% of annual operating budgets. 
So a reduction in security headcount by inherent security through design and operation will do much to reduce security and safeguard operating costs. A reduction in the capital cost for design and build and projected operational costs will bring the cost of novel advanced reactors within the budget of new states and operators, regardless of the maturity of their nuclear sectors. These opportunities will not be entirely dependent upon the maturity of state legislation or regulatory frameworks, but they can be expected to act as a catalyst to increase the tempo of the uptake of NAR technology globally. This in turn will create a challenge for less mature nuclear states to, to achieve a rapid increase in the maturity of security and safeguards functionality across the four C's of capacity, capability, competence, and culture. Next slide, please. An assumed reduction in the human footprint in SMR and AMR sites can be assumed to drive or take advantage of increased innovation in nuclear security and safeguards delivery. This might mean a far heavier dependency by virtue of deliberate design to incorporate autonomous systems with artificial intelligence at their heart to aid precise and timely decision-making whilst retaining the human in the chain for decision-making along critical pathways. Automation and remote operations established through design and economic opportunity may lead to centralized diagnostic and control centers across dispersed fleet operations driven by cost efficiency opportunity. This will have an impact on cybersecurity and the security management of both safety and, sorry, security and safeguards data flows as data flows across real and virtual boundaries. Equally, with inherent design and a reduced requirement for on-site response forces, these can be expected to be dislocated from NAR sites, but within the range to achieve an effective but critical response. So this will place a greater emphasis on the operational function of delay to ensure a sufficient hold on an adversary pathway to provide a timely and effective response. Back to you, Ross. Thanks, George. So if we can have the next slide, there we are, thank you. So the, um, one of the largest areas for the creation of security and safeguards challenges is the wide variety of technologies and fuel types on offer uh, by developers. And NAR designs are a huge range of different technology options, which are the many of which we haven't seen operating before or uh, only in the early US national lab days. Now, we can't easily draw safety and security and excuse me, security safeguards conclusions across all of these systems, but there are some key points that stand out across or, or many of them. So first of all, many of these systems are designed with passive safety by design features, and it, can, it is possible that security credit can be taken for these in reducing vulnerabilities and potential consequences. A range of novel fuel materials are under consideration. And whilst this depends in partly on the individual reactor technologies, this does mean we should revisit certain concepts such as the applicability of theft categorization tables. And certain special consideration must be given to fuels which are mobile within the reactor. So molten salt reactors and reactors fueled by triso fuels. Extended refueling intervals are often uh, a feature of these designs as well with some promising uh, refueling for over, up to 30 years. And it's important that we can discuss ways to maintain continuity of knowledge from a safeguarding perspective over that nuclear material during that period. The less uh, lowered requirement for fueling will lead to a reduced in-transit vulnerability. And it's possible that many of these designs will also wish to store less nuclear material at their site for a, lot, a shorter period of time. Finally, on nuclear waste materials, a range of new methods will be needed in order to characterize these materials. Current models for the calculation of nuclear waste composition are, have been developed for LWR fuels and others, but are not applicable necessarily to, for instance, molten salt, triso and fast reactor fuels. And I'll pass back to George on that. Thanks, George. Thank you. We've spoken about the possibility of new novel advanced reactors being deployed in novel configurations across a dispersed geographical estate, depicted in the illustration here, with three options. This might see multiple reactors, even with differing technologies, co-located in single sites with different operators, perhaps. This may raise the consideration of how security and safeguards are managed to an appropriate level of assurance and to a common standard across differing co-located operators. 
It would also potentially see the concentration of nuclear material in co-located or adjacent installations, creating broader security and safeguard considerations. <coughs> These smaller geographical footprints achieved through design intent will reduce the size of a site to be protected and may, without appropriate security design, integration and planning, result in the reduction of space in which to achieve the delay function. This consideration should drive a design requirement to achieve a minimal possibility of unacceptable radiological consequences through sabotage or time on target for theft by probe and extended delay duration, thereby enabling, enabling a timely and effective response cued by precise detection analytics. Remote sites can also be expected to raise consideration of increased costs of any on-site security footprint through staff rotation, training requirements, and associated travel times, amongst others. Acknowledging this potential adds to the mix of cost concern, which should drive innovation to reduce the on-site security footprint. Finally, a key security consideration will be associated with any vision or planning intent to transport fueled reactors from a production line. This, along with the protection of NAR production lines, will generate security considerations across the NAR production process, the packaging for transportation, and the protection of the transportation operation itself. Next slide, please. So the final area of difference, which I'll touch on very briefly, is the differing range of developer business models and marketing approaches we're seeing. And unlike with large conventional nuclear power plants, we are seeing a very wide range of uh, businesses, operators starting up uh, with very small companies of maybe you know six people or so starting to undertake reactor design operations. And it is partly for this reason that we're seeing these small businesses without large budgets potentially deprioritizing security as part of their design process until later. And so this is something that needs to be considered. Finally, many are marketing on, and on the basis of um, separating their NAR technology from the challenges of the past in terms of nuclear accidents, uh, the kind of publicly perceived challenges of nuclear waste management and so on. But it must be remembered that a single incident at any NAR site will tarnish the reputation of all NARs and thus security will also have a reputational risk protection function. Can we have the next slide please? And two concluding slides. The conclusions in this research span all stakeholders in the civil nuclear sector, all of whom have a responsibility to look ahead in the way in which design, build, commissioning and operation of novel advanced reactors are approached. These novel technologies provide opportunity to review state, regulator, designer and operator methods and mechanisms by which they deliver nuclear power technologies to innovate through an integrated design process from early concept design all the way through to operation based upon the deployment of novel solutions, the prime purpose of which is to deliver more affordable, safe, secure and safeguarded nuclear power to a greater range of possible state entities. Academic institutions can assist technology developers in this respect by providing robust and disciplined intellectual argument to underpin conceptual designs. In the same manner, NAR operators will benefit from deliberately embedding security and safeguards design into safety engineering design processes to achieve comprehensive and coherent design assurance across safety, security and safeguards perspectives. Next slide. <laughs> At a national level, regulators may need to develop adaptable goals-based collaborative approaches to promote a strong culture of innovation to address some of the security considerations but most importantly, the opportunities that NAR technology creates. National stakeholders may need to review policies and legislation to ensure that they enable rather than constrain NAR technology and its global marketing and sale at an increased, at an increased tempo when compared to that of large conventional nuclear reactor technologies. Of course, it should go without saying that the IAA here in Vienna will have a critical role in shaping and guiding these considerations. Next slide, please. So to conclude, you will find this in much more detail in the publication that is available either on your table or at the link uh, shown on the slide there. 
And we have also a range of other publications in the Nuclear Security Program, which again, a range of which are provided in the room. Um, for those who haven't got one in front of you, then there are others around and we can provide a copy to you. Um, and for everyone else available online at our, at our website. But that's it from me. If we can go to the final slide. Thank you very much. And I will pass back to Chris. Great. Thanks, uh, Ross and George, for setting the scene so well. We're now going to move to our next speaker, uh, Duncan Barley, who's not in the room with us, but hopefully is able to, to join us online. Duncan is the uh, lead for civil nuclear security regulation of new technologies at the UK's Office for Nuclear Regulation, ONR. Duncan, can you hear us? Well, I can see you and I can hear you. Could you hear me? You're coming through clear, Duncan. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if we could just have the next slide, please. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, good morning, everybody from from Somerset in England. Um, I'm just going to talk particularly uh, uh, about um, our work with um, mature technology, small module reactors, and the more advanced uh, models uh, as a regulator. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at the right hand side of the si slide, you can see what we do as a regulator. Um, what the slide doesn't say is that obviously we need to um, set our expectations to those coming into this small module reactor, advanced module reactor market. Indeed, we, we have done. That involves us to engage fairly early with them. But uh, as we recover our costs through operators, this is quite different. So we require heavily on government funding. Um, we just so you understand is that we, we simply are not there to to uh, ensure compliance, but we do the early work uh, with vendors on behalf of the, the, the government, really setting the conditions for for new and old um, uh, organizations with it within this wide civil nuclear um, environment. So we, we, we're there to engage early and explain what our regulatory expectations are. Then we uh, review whatever they produce on behalf of the government. That is, we, we review it as a competent authority. And then they enter into a generic design assessment if they wish. This has just been revised uh, in order that it fits nicely with, with uh, more advanced designs and all the stuff that comes with them. An example of that is uh, on the left of the screen, which is our technical guidance on, on GD, GDA. So we assess through that. And then the story doesn't really stop there because we are the authority that um, grants a license. That's a license to, to build. You need a site and you need an organization that's going to deliver it. And ultimately, you need an organization that's going to operate it all the way through to decommissioning. Uh, and therefore, the whole life lifespan of these these new plants um, falls into, you might say, our jurisdiction. So next slide. Um, the regulatory context obviously fits in with the broader context that has already been uh, uh, nicely explained uh, by the, uh, the King's team. But essentially, uh, we're looking at fourth generation, but we're also looking at these more advanced models of uh, third generation, more conventional ones like the Rolls-Royce SMR. Uh, which has just entered into our, our GDA, Generic Design Assessment. Um, as George said, there's different operations. Um, as Ross said, there's different uh, management models. Um, and again, with, with the previous speakers, passive safety, so what for security, new fuels, so what for security, modular build, modular unit, um, and multiple unit, uh, uh, which has been touched on. Uh, what hasn't necessarily is cogeneration. What happens if these are going to be used for heat generation? Some of these very, very small ones coming onto the market, I mean, they're, they're relatively tiny compared with the UK uh, Hinkley Point C. So they're not necessary to be tap, uh, to be plugged into the grid. Um, that, that introduces a, a, another aspect for, for the wider security and for, for where the government risk appetite sits. We touched upon different governance models. The commercial imperative over lifetime has been highlighted. For us as a regulator, we're quite used to a sort of consecutive, you know, come in, engage with us, enter into GDA, move to license, so on. And that sequence seems to have been broken, uh, if, if only by the expectations of the new business models. Uh, and of course, um, 
they started to arrive. Um, we, if you look on the left, entry to genetic design assessment for our advanced technologies. That's the guidance from the government. I'm sure they'll talk about it later. Uh, and, and we, uh, they come to us as part of a number of people who will, will review whether or not they are lined up nicely to go into generic design assessment, which in, in fact, there's no legal requirement to do GDA, but it seems a, a good idea to de-risk from my side as a regulator and from their side. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the question is, um, as indeed the, the panel might say, are the regulators ready? Well, the answer is, we've been working quite hard at this for uh, about the last four years with government funding, uh, we've used our recent experience from a, a larger, more conventional reactor, the UK HPR 1000 in GDA. So things like secure by design, working closely with safety, uh, not safeguards on that occasion. Um, the whole challenge of, of security and uh, the complex engineering of one of these plants, um, modification control, um, a lot from that. And um, indeed, that's been a great experience. We've engaged early with a number of vendors over the last few years with all sorts of technology, different types of fuels, different coolants, different sizes, uh, the full canopy of, of everything uh, that you could possibly think. We've accepted vendor innovation. We have our own innovation cell. Innovation is something that we embrace. Uh, as George said, secure by design, we expect it. We, we, we ran really through it, expecting it with the last GDA and um, they, they did embrace it and they did use it as best they could to influence the design. Um, albeit some of these designs were already in the generation three, the, 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 to some degree they're set, but it doesn't stop us from asking them to conduct a, a, a risk assessment against design, vital area, cybersecurity risk assessments, all that. As was mentioned, we've moved from prescription to outcome focused and with that still embedding, but um, it really fits in with innovation. It's really up for the vendor or the uh, the requesting party to come to us and make claims about security. Certain passive measures reduce security risk. The new fuel does. The size of the reactor, if it's tiny, very small. But they've got to do that, not us. We're, we're not there to do the homework for them. The blend of cyber, insider and physical risk still exists. We haven't really deviated from that. An increased collaboration with safety experts. We understand what that is. We're working with the, uh, the IEA SMR Regulators Forum on the three S's, as we call it, safety, security, and safeguards. Fairly ambitious, um, but, but um, we're pushing it from the, from the security side internationally. And of course, ultimately, it's the government to dictate the risk appetite, not for the regulator. Next slide. Okay, I mentioned innovation and, and the previous presentation talked about the opportunities and risks posed by these much smaller designs. Some of them may not, not be that small. If you take the Rolls-Royce SMR mature technology, it is not that small compared with some others uh, coming into the market. Um, I don't want to dwell on, on what the, the, the vendors might claim, but uh, they could claim uh, a number of benefits from the design. I'm sure that'll be touched on later. Next slide. And I would just conclude. So what am I thinking about as touched on? We are working heavily on regula regulatory uh, flexibility. Our outcome based ideas and our secure by design approach. That's what we expect the regular uh, the, those who are bringing these designs into the market and come to us for review or for assessment. We expect them to adopt that approach. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, if they don't, they still got to substantiate their claims. We understand the commercial drivers. We're not there to stymie innovation or indeed make, bringing these into the market, but we still have to fulfill our role as regulators. Code generation I've touched on, supply chain, cyber risk, the relationship between cyber and safety control and instrumentation is a very interesting one. And as George said, we've got to up, up our game, regulators and regulated vendors and everything else. New people coming into the market still need to meet our expectations. They still need to understand what regulation means albeit in a flex, uh, we, we are flexible, but we still, we you know we are there to protect the public. And that, rep that, that, that applies just as much to small modular reactors as it does to the gigawatt size. So that's it from the regulator, from the UK perspective, and we are working with our international colleagues. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Duncan. That was almost perfectly 
eight minutes, so that was that was excellent. We'll, we'll circle back the questions at the, at the end. So now I'd like to pass to our next speaker, uh, Alvaro Abito, uh, Program Manager at the World Institute for Nuclear Security. Alvaro, over to you. Thank you, uh, Chris, and uh, thank you for inviting the World Institute for Nuclear Security to this uh, excellent side event. And good morning, everyone here in this room and all of all the, the audience following uh, uh, online. Uh, today, I'm going uh, to focus on the security of advanced uh, reactor and the implication for designer and developer of uh, this technology at the World Institute for Nuclear Security, WINS. We understand that they are a key uh, a pillar uh, for the successful deployment of uh, this uh, new technology. Next slide, please. So the World Institute for Nuclear Security has been uh, working in this topic for at least four, four years, since uh, 2018. So uh, we have conducted international workshop where we have uh, uh, brought together more than uh, 100 subject matter experts. And we have also uh, published uh, with the support of our friend from the Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, a report on, on, on uh, this topic. When I refer to uh, advanced reactor, I also refer to small modular reactor. So this is 300 megawatt uh, uh, electric uh, technology. But as you know, there are also other design that goes beyond this 300 megawatt uh, electric and that also pose uh, uh, a particular risk to the security framework that uh, we are uh, looking um, very uh, carefully. As you will see in my presentation, um, there is also another subset within the uh, advanced reactor, and this is a micro reactor. And for this, we also are aligned with the uh, IAEA um, uh, uh, term. And, and here we look at design who are up to uh, uh, 10 megawatt ele electric. So we have a wide range, not only of, uh, of power output, but also of technologies that uh, uh, produce this. So I'm gonna uh, briefly talk about some of the, of the, of the key uh, uh, themes that support security uh, and that these are uh, 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 work in progress uh, uh, at WINS. Next slide, please. So uh, we uh, uh, understand that the uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 the international uh, guidance, as it was mentioned by previous speaker, there are uh, uh, it is applicable to the current technology, but there are clearly some uh, uh, more uh, uh, work to be done in terms of adapting uh, those guidance. So clearly, there are some uh, publication, and we recognize here NSS uh, 13, and it is a very interesting recent publication NSS uh, 35G that talks about lifetime of the. Uh, security during the lifetime of a nuclear facility. And this is uh, here where we, where we believe that there should be a, uh, put some uh, more uh, focus on the uh, pre-design and the conceptual phase uh, uh, of this uh, uh, design. Uh, it has not mentioned uh, here before, but also at WINS we recognize that uh, uh, having a, a good coordination uh, in terms of the international community, not only for the nuclear safety and, and the security uh, sphere, but also within the, the IAEA and other international organization for uh, nuclear power and the, uh, and the process, as you may be familiar with, the IAEA milestone approach, which is uh, necessary for countries to follow when they will uh, uh, acquire a new uh, nuclear power plan or they decide to enter uh, the nuclear power. Um, while there is very clear guidance for large commercial nuclear power plan, there is still some unresolved question of whether a country who will engage for the first time uh, 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 in uh, nuclear power will have to follow a similar uh, uh, approach that takes usually to 10 to 15 years and consists of uh, 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 10 phases, whether that approach would apply, for example, for a micro reactor or a small modular uh, uh, <coughs> re reactor. Um, it was mentioned before by, by uh, Duncan and we, uh, uh, that the, 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 the regulation will also pose um, new uh, 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 issues. In here, uh, I believe uh, a more risk informed rather than prescriptive approach 
will facilitate the uh, the application for uh, the nuclear security principles, uh, particularly taking into account uh, the wide range of, of technology. And talking about this wide range of technology, please, uh, next slide. Uh, at WINS, we try to to, to uh, simplify uh, the, um, the categorization of this technology. There are multiple in terms of uh, a fuel that it use power output, as I, as I mentioned uh, before, but we focus in this three uh, main families, which is uh, triso, molten salt reactor, fast reactor, and a four category of micro reactor. Um, uh, each of them has its own particularities in terms of, uh, of uh, security. And uh, let's go to the next slide, please, to look at what are the, uh, the common security uh, challenges. And I think this is the most uh, important slide that I will uh, present today. As I said, we focus on the uh, developers' uh, uh, concern. One of the main ch uh, challenges that we um, have uh, 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 identified uh, is uh, the licensing uh, process. We know that regulator, as it was mentioned by Duncan, uh, has, uh, are making good, great effort, for example, ONR through the uh, generic design assessment, the, uh, G the GDA, but uh, the, the, the new paradigm here is that we have multiple co companies who are not fully familiar on how to follow this uh, process. And there is actually, if you have uh, followed um, the application of some uh, reactor, unfortunately, some promising technology has, has failed in, in this uh, process. So we think a lot of guidance for developers that you will see in my uh, last slide for recommendation. It's a necessary cost will be a, a major challenge with her. And we can read in the in the King's College report that CAPES capital expenditure uh, might uh, be reduced. That will also enhance uh, uh, further appetite for investor um, in that uh, area. But there is still uh, still a, a concern, a challenge to map out that cost for uh, security. Automation is a major challenge. It could be seen uh, as a benefit the the, the introduction of uh, passive safety uh, uh, a system that eliminates some of the uh, um, design basis accident for safety and as a consequence it could also uh, um, uh, um, be uh, kind of an enabler for uh, easing security consideration um, in some uh, cases. Also automation uh, from our conversation with uh, developers can reduce uh, potential uh, uh, number of insider threat, but at the same time, there will also introduce uh, vulnerability for a cybersecurity uh, uh, perspective. But that really depends on, on the kind of technology that it's used. In terms of purely security uh, uh, challenges, we have identified four main challenges. One of them is the, uh, the, the, the consideration of high assay, uh, low and rich um, uranium. Uh, this is actually from our conversation with developers uh, at uh, uh, terminology that it could also uh, um, be a, disad uh, a disadvantage because still low and rich uranium and, and they, they, they told uh, in our interviews and in our research that they, this has uh, created some burden for them in terms of uh, dealing with safeguard and, uh, and security uh, uh, aspect. Also the major uh, uh, a challenge of high acid and low enriched uranium is the bottleneck uh, for uh, uh, um, companies to be able to manufacture uh, that fuel. And in that uh, uh, contest uh, right now is the, uh, it's a major uh, bottleneck for it. For example, in, in the Western, there are not enough uh, technical experience to uh, produce this in, in, a, in a factory uh, uh, massive form this um, this uh, uh, fuel uh, to according to our research is only the Russian Federation who is in a position to support this fuel at a massive scale in the short term. So this is something that uh, it was also pointed out by some of the uh, Western uh, uh, developers. As it was mentioned, also remote siting and and, and transport, um, remote siting. Uh, uh, there are con security concerns for the time of responding in case of, of, of an accident, we need to take into account that some of these small modular um, reactor uh, are not competing with large nuclear power plant, but more like with diesel generator, for example, in regions um, like Canada, and it's difficult to, uh, to, to have an effective response there. And also 
for uh, the location of this reactor there are some uh, regulator that asks for a <coughs> minimum of uh, 10 miles for the emergency planning zone so in that sense it's also a uh, hard next, next slide please and we think that the way for uh, solving uh, or adopting all of this is through uh, the security by design engaging very early with the developer and with this i will conclude in my uh, next slide uh, some a little bit over time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here, I would just wanted to put some of the security uh, recommendation where we encourage uh, uh, security developers to uh, 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 address security as early as possible. WINS in particular now is focusing on benchmarking and evaluation for these developers to understand if they are following security and standards and to what extent they can help each other uh, through WINS by creating uh, forums to exchange, exchange best uh, practices and lessons learned. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Alvaro. We'll now pass to our next speaker, Jeremy Edwards, who's Head of Nuclear Security Strategy at the UK's National Nuclear Laboratory. Jeremy, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my thanks to King's for, for both the paper and the opportunity to participate in this panel this morning. Um, as stated, there's strong drivers for a resurgence in nuclear to play a significant part in sustainable low carbon economy. Um, but as we know, and the paper identifies, conventional nuclear power plants you know, are a significant investment in both time and cost, um, often prohibitively so for, for, many, uh, for many nations. Like SMR particularly um, offers an incredible opportunity to remove that barrier to entry along with the many benefits um, that are cited for nuclear safety. But with that will come you know, increased numbers of units, increased global distribution, of power plants, um, and many new entrants. And that'll lead to capacity building, transportation, and standardization challenges in the future. I think as highlighted by Duncan, you know, real interest to me are the deployment opportunities that these technologies present and the huge benefits to society beyond those of purely providing electricity for power generation to the grid. Some of those deployments potentially challenge you know, our current frame of reference and norms with regard to nuclear security. Reduce capital, the promise of low op um, operating expenditure, open up opportunity for co-location with industrial sites and applications. And couple this with the drives from green economy and increased exploration of hydrogen and ammonia um, as fossil fuel alternatives, you know, and increasing exploration of nuclear as a key enabler um, in this low carbon power uh, for these concepts. But this will present challenges um, as identified in the paper and from the previous speakers, small sites, complex and shared boundaries, limited clear area or open ground, which are um, typical to permit detection and delay. Um, as we shorten supply chains and, uh, and move to more sustainable logistics, you know, we'll increase proximity to centers of population potentially, rather than remote locations. The converse, however, could be you know, these applications, SMR, AMRs, potentially lend themselves to some of the remote um, uh, territory type applications um, with some developers exploring potentially unstaffed, totally remotely operated um, facilities. Public acceptance, you know, for, for this going forwards will be, will be a challenge. The key will be demonstrating they are safe and secure is upon us as a community to ensure. Small reactors, yep, they'll generate typically less revenue. Um, the operating costs will be a key variable in this. Um, and in so, small reactors represent a bit of a paradox. In theory, less inventory, less potential for harm, but potentially more accessible. Maintaining a deterrence posture, such that we're used to today, may present disproportionate cost relative to the radiological harm potential. Couple this with increased interest in mobile applications, barges, potentially applications in propulsion for commercial shipping. This will all prompt your drivers for novel security solutions to be derived and incorporated um, through applications secured by design and also uh, throughout the licensing process. 
So I can see balancing some of the socio-political and technical challenges will prove to be a key um, focus over the next few years. Maintaining consistency globally will present greater challenges. I think highlights the relevance of this week's CPP and M RevCon and also the need for, um, to maintain that under future review. Adapting to change in threats um, and emerging technologies, both adversarial and also beneficial to aid securing sites and operations will need to be a focus through licensing and early deployment. As will future proofing or consideration of future site development you know, and change um, will need to be accounted for. As highlighted by George and others, you know, many sites will develop in a piecemeal fashion with one unit progressively increasing to um, full fleet operations. So dynamic proportionate maintenance of security whilst balancing cost, regulator and public confidence will be challenging, I guess immensely rewarding professionally, but I think critical to developing affordable, safe and secure net zero ambitions. Great, thanks very much, uh, Jeremy. And also thank you for keeping your remarks short. Uh, so our, past, our last speaker, uh, last but not least, is Jessica Bufford. She's a program officer at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, where she works in the Nuclear Materials Security Team. Uh, Jessica, over. Great, thank you. And thanks to King's College London for this opportunity to speak to you this morning about challenges for advanced reactors. Uh, so as Chris noted, my name is Jessica Bufford, and I'm on the Nuclear Materials Security Program at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. For those of you who might not be familiar with NTI, we are a US-based nonprofit, nonpartisan global security organization focused on reducing nuclear and biological threats imperiling humanity. Uh, so we work to build a safer world through innovation, cooperation, and action. And these kinds of forums are so important to that. So this week, all of us have gathered together to review the amended uh, Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials. And as we've already heard this morning, Advanced reactors pose new challenges and new opportunities for nuclear security. Yet nuclear security doesn't exist in a vacuum. Reactors as design must take into account safeguards and safety considerations. And the interaction of these three impulses can sometimes have unexpected consequences. So I'd like to spend my time talking about both security and safeguards considerations for advanced reactors uh, at a, a bit of a conceptual level. Um, and before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the participants of a roundtable on advanced reactors that NTI conducted in collaboration with Third Way, the Good Energy Collective, and the University of Michigan School of Engineering. Their work uh, has informed my comments today. So as we've seen today, advanced reactors covers a lot of ground. However, uh, there are some general questions and observations that I want to pose about the application of security and safeguards based on reactor form, fuel materials, and siting locations. So first, the form. Some advanced reactors will have small facility footprints. And we've already heard some of the security implications of smaller facilities from Ross and George. From a safeguards perspective, it may mean less time is needed to inspect the facility, but it also may mean that key parts of the facility are harder to reach for inspectors. Some advanced reactors will have longer lifetime cores, and reducing refueling can provide important safety and security benefits. But refueling is also an important moment for safeguards inspections. So less refueling will require a different approach to safeguards and impact how the IEA draws their safeguards conclusion for these advanced reactors. Some of these reactors may be mobile and those come with a unique set of challenges. For security, concerns about theft or sabotage, how do you maintain a moving perimeter and what does defense in depth look like for a reactor that's moving? And from a safeguards perspective, how does mobility affect the risk of diversion of these materials uh, and even safeguards obligations if these are moving um, through international waters or uh, between states? And how do techniques like environmental sampling apply to mobile reactors? Some reactors are designed to be automated or to operate at very low staff levels. Cybersecurity is a rapidly evolving field and systems that once were considered impenetrable are now being hacked with greater regularity. How will the pace of cybersecurity patches keep up with adversarial threats? And how will cyber challenges impact the remote transition of safeguards data? 
Some reactors are designed to be remotely deployed in hard to reach locations. And so how will those reactors receive cybersecurity updates? What happens if access to that area is cut off because of political instability or a natural disaster? And from a safeguards perspective, how do you conduct inspections at a place that is deliberately difficult to reach? In addition to the form of these reactors, we should be thinking about uh, the implications of the fuel that they'll be using. So some of them will be using LEU fuel that we know and understand well, but potentially in new formats or applications that may pose new challenges. Some of these fuels, uh, some of these reactors will be using fuel forms that are not as widely deployed, like molten salt or pebble bed reactors. And some will be using fuels that are less widely distributed, like high assay, low enriched uranium. Molten salt reactors pose unique safeguards challenges as the whole reactor may be needed to be treated as a mass balance area rather than only one section of the facility. And while we have some techniques today for treating uh, and safeguarding mass balance areas, it's unusual to have an entire reactor treated as, as one. Pebble bed reactors are often considered safeguards challenges because the fuel uh, is very difficult to count. It's practically a bulk material. However, fuel pebbles are difficult to reprocess, and so that could make diversion less attractive. And so that will require different approaches to thinking about uh, diversion risks and, and application of safeguards. And then we have high assay, low enriched uranium or HALU. And they pose a different security challenge and a safeguards challenge. So while the international community already has some experience with HALU and research reactors, the deployment of advanced reactors using HALU re will require a much more robust system of production, transportation, use and disposal that can handle larger quantities of material moving through it. In order to support HALU reactors, more and new front end fuel cycle facilities will be needed. And HALU is closer to weapons usable levels of enrichment that traditional LEU is not. And so it increases concerns about diversion and clandestine enrichment by determined proliferant states. And the material may also have greater interest to um, adversaries for theft or uh, nefarious uses. Countries may be incentivized to develop their own enrichment facilities, increasing the number of countries uh, with uh, potential nuclear weapons breakout capacity and increasing the number of facilities that need to be safeguarded and more facilities will need to be protected at a higher level of security. Uh, they'll also be increasing transportation of this fuel that will require more fuel um, transport uh, vessels and different levels of, of security in shipment uh, than standard LEU fuel shipment today. Separately, exporting and importing complete reactors also poses some challenges. When do safeguards start to apply? As soon as the fuel is put into the reactor, when it arrives on location, what security measures will be needed to prevent theft or sabotage of a fully fueled reactor in transport? And are transit countries prepared to support these measures? And the back end of these fuel cycles cannot be forgotten as we push towards development. These new reactors will have spent fuel with different characteristics than light water reactors of today. And so governments need to be considering what if any, additional safeguards or security measures need to be considered on the back end, and what disposition pathways are available in emerging nuclear countries. So governments should be including fuel, spent fuel considerations when looking at grant porting licensees for export or import of these advanced reactors. And I wanna conclude by spending a few minutes thinking about the implications of the broad deployment that these reactors may potentially see. Many of these designs are targeting countries that need energy generation better tailored to their electrical grids. And while these nuclear reactors could help meet global energy demands, it means they'll be deployed in areas that are different in important ways than where they're being developed. Countries have different security environments. And so reactors need to be, reactor developers need to be considering these differences in security environments as they're looking to export their designs. Second, when thinking about safeguards, some of these reactors are being developed in nuclear weapon states, which have a different safeguard environment than non-nuclear weapon states. And so developers will need to be considering these safeguards consideration early on in the design phase in order to facilitate their export to, from, a non, from a nuclear weapon state to a non-nuclear weapon state. 
And third, the broad deployment of advanced reactors will increase the number of facilities that will need to be safeguarded around the world. Smaller power reactors, even without substantial design change, will have an important resource implication for the IAEA. And so these new reactor uh, designs and fuel cycles may require the development of new safeguards approaches or use equipment that doesn't exist yet. So the challenge for the IAEA is to develop a wide range of new approaches um, in anticipation of some of these developments without fully knowing which ones will be successful. And so there are opportunities for member state support programs to be working with the agency even now to help support the deployment of these reactors. <laughs> So I agree with Duncan's observation that developer security claims need to be substantiated during the design process and their safeguards claims will likewise need to be substantiated. Uh, so one of the great challenges of this space is uh, designing against an uncertain future. As we've already seen, uh, the events, global events can change the prevailing situation rapidly. Uh, and it, I think it is important for all of us to be working together to help make these uh, reactors deployable and successful wherever they may go. So with that, I'll finish my remarks. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks very much, Jessica. We've got about 16 minutes or so uh, for questions. So invite uh, people from the floor here um, to uh, pose any questions they might have if you introduce yourself and just say where you're from. Uh, similarly, for those of you listening online, if you're able to uh, pop a question in the chat box, I'll do my best to summarize it for you for the panel as well. And maybe, oh, a question right there, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Lou Reitman. I'm with the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. Um, Mr. Edwards already mentioned this issue, um, but I'm quite curious what the current state of public acceptance of some of the security innovations that these reactors necessitate is at the moment, especially thinking about remote control centers, automation, and all the mentioned the issues that Ms. Buffett just mentioned. I'm just imagining the various headlines that the Daily Mail could <laughs> come up with on these things. So I'm curious for your perspective. Thank you. Very good. So yeah, question with regards to public acceptance, maybe any outreach that's been done by developers of this technology uh, to the public. Would anyone like to, to take that one? Ross. Uh, so we've had some conversations about this with when we were preparing the report. Um, and I've been asked by several people, what is the public acceptance of this? I don't have, I, I've done some looking around. I didn't find any good answers really um, on this in the in the scientific literature. I don't know if many of my colleagues have done anything up here, but um, yeah, I didn't find anything in the scientific literature on this. Okay, great. So that's yeah, probably definitely an area to, uh, to look at. So yeah, thanks for raising the question. Uh, Laura, please. Good morning, Laura Holgate from the United States. Um, I really appreciated the comments that several folks made about areas for future research. Let me add to the list <laughs> um, on some things that, that um, weren't necessarily mentioned. But also I, have a, I had a question, I think it was in Duncan's presentation, where it was mentioned that the um, government would determine risk tolerance. And so I'd be interested in what could be said about how that's determined, how that's expressed, and how that's enforced. Uh, through the regulate, because it wasn't clear how the regulator fits in that process. Um, in terms of places to continue to look, and I uh, applaud Jessica's presentation for mentioning this, but I think there's more work that needs to be done as we think about enrichment, uh, moving from large scale production uh, of high, high assay LEU uh, at the fuel fabrication facilities for these novel fuel types, um, and also what the uh, material content uh, and therefore proliferation attractiveness might be for spent fuel, both forms and isotopics um, as, they, as they might relate to that. And there, there were some comments made about spent fuel stored on site or not, but what are the implications for some of the spent fuel, for example, uh, for uh, current national um, spent fuel uh, storage plans and so on. Are they different? Do they need a new plan? Are they more risky from a proliferation with that point of view or whatever? Um, and then finally, something that is, I, I haven't heard anyone talk about uh, in these conversations, but has recently been um, niggling around in the back of my brain is part of the um, claims made for um, 
uh, cheaper manufacturing of these uh, of these new reactors, the smaller ones especially, is an increasing reliance on off-the-shelf technologies or a, a reduction in the need for what, what in the U.S. is called nuclear stamps, uh, you know, the, a, a particularly highly validated um, uh, supply uh, process and manufacturing process. The potential for supply chain supply chain contamination with um, with clandestine, I'm sorry, with counterfeit parts or other other aspects that could be, for example, um, instigated by a hostile state um, or uh, some intentional malicious effort to create a security problem or a safety problem at one of these sites. And I'm just wondering, thinking about the, the security of a supply chain, not just the availability, but the quality control um, of a commercial supply chain and how that relates uh, in, this, in the security context of these, of these reactors. Thanks very much. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, lots of food for thought there. And I think several questions perhaps uh, within that. But let's start with Duncan, perhaps. Duncan, if you're still with us, um, question in terms of uh, UK yeah. government risk tolerance, how that's set and managed through the outcome focused uh, regulatory framework, please. Uh, uh, yes, certainly. Um, uh, therefore, um, in terms of uh, a developer coming forward and, and saying uh, into uh, a more formal process like, like our generic design assessment, it is that, uh, you know, what, what, what are they? Um, uh, what are they protecting against? You know, what 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 have they got to achieve? Well, uh, as it stands at the moment, uh, from a regulatory point of view, uh, we are looking at uh, theft and sabotage. So, from a sabotage perspective, we're looking at offsite dose, doses, and that uh, those dose levels, which in the UK are not widely available, but in other countries, I think the US uh, do do publish them. So the, those numbers, uh, which are the uh, the dose levels, whether they're in uh, usually in our case medicivats, would would enable a graded approach. In other words, there'd be vital areas and um, uh, the more high consequence vital areas. So that number is given uh, to to us uh, by 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 government or, or by the appropriate department, which is 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 Bayes. Bayes. Uh, the other, um, in terms of risk appetite, is uh, that the UK government subscribes to the international agreements uh, in terms of, of theft, and that is the categorization of nuclear material, uh, that is the categorization of um, intermediate and low-level waste, and containing nuclear material, all about nuclear material and reactive sources containing nuclear material. So, so that the we, we don't set the bar. Um, uh, and this tends to be on the base of consequence rather than continuity of operation. Uh, the second thing the government gives us is the design-based threat. Um, and again, uh, these two topics, uh, certainly in the bilats and trilats we've had with uh, our regulatory colleagues, whether it's the NRC or the Canadian equivalent, uh, and others through the SMR Regulators Forum. So, so the, these are topics that we like to discuss, uh, but are very nationally based, national risk appetite, uh, and equally the, the, that's the DBT and, and those numbers in terms of site dose. So we don't regulate uh, reputation. Um, there are commercial responsibilities to, uh, to, to the host government, which are outside of regulation. Um, we, we've updated our regulation the process in terms of uh, whether we cover, we have virus over uh, remote sites and, and we will in the future. So, but that's that's where we stand in terms of, when I talk about risk appetite, um, I don't dictate it. Uh, my organization doesn't dictate it as a regulator. It's it's the state. Yes, please, Oli. Sorry, just as the representative of the government here, probably good for me just to very just very briefly chip in there or just completely echo everything that Gun Duncan says just in terms of wider context um I think for, from our approach as, as we've said on several occasions we want to empower the organizations and industry themselves who perhaps know their context better um but it demands a regular conversation with government uh, both formally and informally which is what Duncan is, is touch, touching upon there and a, and a regular consultation with with policy experts within government um and i think just to be very clear that there's um within legislation there's a duty for onr to report to 
to, to report to Parliament via our Secretary of State. So um, there is a, a formal uh, accountability to our, to our parliamentary system as well as this ongoing dialogue too. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Shelley. George, do you want to? Yeah, I just wondered if I could make a quick comment on that relationship between um, the state's view of its risk appetite and um, a commercial operator's view. Um, I think there's an inherent tension there, especially in an outcome-focused risk-managed regulatory framework where the risk un unambiguously lies with the operator and the operator will seek to exercise that risk through its own risk management processes. And I have seen that a commercial operator will have a different risk barrier, different risk threshold, sorry, from that of which the state might have because the state takes into consideration other factors associated with the management of its risk, such as reputational damage in the international community, which the commercial operator will interpret differently um, uh, and I see a tension there which exists at the moment. I don't think it's insurmountable, but it is a tension which could be exacerbated um, and heightened within novel advanced reactor technology simply because of the fact that um, if secure by design is not inherently safe and secure, so it sufficiently reduces threats to um, reactor technology and fuels and waste and the like well, then there will be a more challenging discussion to be had because I think the gap might widen between a state's perception of its risk appetite and that of a commercial operator. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, George. I don't have any questions. Oh, please. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Noah Mayhew. I'm uh, also from the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. Um, thank you to all of the panelists today for what has been a very interesting start to uh, this this review conference. I have I'm not sure if this is a comment or a question. I think I'll figure that out when I'm by the time I'm done saying it. But either way, I would um, appreciate your thoughts on the following. So several of the panelists have mentioned the the value added by focusing on communication or the development of guidance for uh, the uh, design of these reactors. And particularly being very important because, uh, as Jessica pointed out, uh, many of these reactors are being developed in nuclear weapon states. And uh, as I think was mentioned, uh, if not, I'm mentioning it, many of these reactors, at least in the United States, are being developed by um, non-governmental entities, by startups. Uh, so the question or comment, I guess, is um, as important as safeguards and security by design are, I have faith that government developed um, you know, projects are, are going to take these things into account, or at least I would hope they would. People have said, both in this forum and in many others, that it's very important that um, there is this communication and guidance with advanced reactor developers, but uh, I wonder how much thought has been given to what it would take to incentivize some of the non-governmental uh, advanced reactor developers to, in fact, uh, look into these things and prioritize them, the sort of what's in it for us kind of thing. Um, we at the VCDNP have looked into this a little bit, uh, no formal product, uh, projects as of yet, but um, in thinking about how one might conduct outreach to these advanced reactor designers who are not associated with governments, um, one of the sort of hurdles in my mind is basically how do you get them to care? Um, and, and maybe I'm, you know, casting too bleak a, <laughs> a picture onto what non-governmental uh, advanced reactor developers think of as priorities, but I would appreciate your perspectives on that. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Noah. And yeah, I think um, uh, Ross and George sort of highlighted in their introduction this sort of disconnect uh, that may be occurring between developers and, uh, and operators, although I think Duncan was perhaps a bit more uh, positive in some of the early stage discussions that he's been having uh, in this area, at least from a sort of regulatory perspective to make sure that licenses will sort of comply, uh, at least in the UK context. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this. Jessica, please. Yeah, thank you for that excellent question. And I think that is one of the big challenges uh, where we're all in this room because we care very deeply about nuclear security, um, but communicating that to others can be a challenge at times. Uh, and I think certainly uh, relying on um, regulatory approval is one way of motivating them to care, uh, You know, including that as part of their uh, process to get um, a uh, reactor license um, is important. I think it's also important to, for uh, reactor developers and uh, the governments that are um, regulating those reactors to be thinking about uh, what is the argument for export of these uh, reactors. 
and can you make some of these safeguard safety and security features um, points of sale and, and try use them as uh, attractive pieces of the uh, commercial pitch to other countries. Uh, and if in as much as uh, these communities can work together to bake that into the sales pitch, I think we'll see a lot more uptake in these by the reactor developers. So those, those are my thoughts. Thanks, Jessica. And Ollie? Thank you. I think it's a really important um, uh, important question, just to completely echo the number of the, uh, um, your, the views expressed here. Regulatory approval is obviously really important. I mean, there's a sort of point here that they have to care if we're going to continue the relationship uh, with government and to keep uh, progressing and, and working with us. And I think um, yeah, from a government point of view, yes, we have we don't want this sensitive technology to get out to the people that we don't want it to. That's a sort of key tenant of peaceful uses of, of nuclear technology and capability. So we have a clear interest in, in communicating and sustaining that dialogue with industry. And I think if I just draw an analogy to, to the work that we do on cyber, not necessarily in the nuclear space, but just in general, particularly within the UK, with the National Cyber Security Centre, which has been working a lot with industry to sort of strengthen their cyber security structures, because that not only is important from a security point of view, but that's also a reputational issue for industry and then particularly the private sector in general. Uh, and working with government to ensure that their systems are in a good, in a better place because they don't want their customers exposed to sort of cybersecurity issues and risk. That's a, just, a, I draw that analogy, not only because it's pertinent because we've talk, been speaking about cybersecurity within the context of nuclear security, but it's a really good, good illustration of the, the dialogue and the partnership that you can drive with industry across various sectors because there are mutual interests in, in doing so. Great, thanks very much, Ollie. We've actually had a question coming on line as well. Uh, the question relates to security costs. Um, it's quite a specific one, but I wonder if anyone could comment perhaps in a more general sense, what is the potential with some of these new reactor designs in terms of reducing the cost for security over their lifetime, or is it too early perhaps to, to make that sort of calculation? George. Ross. Yes, I'm um, just quoting from personal experience. Um, when I said in my brief comments that security costs can typically range between the range of uh, eight and ten percent of annual operating budgets, that was my own personal experience as a director of security. And um, of those eight to ten percent, probably seventy percent or seventy-five percent of that was head, head, head count costs for unarmed and armed guarding. Uh, and so staff security costs are extremely high. Um, and it's an opportunity cost. If you can reduce staff security costs, you can devote more to the operational budget for, for the actual reactor plant decommissioning process or, or, or whatever it is. It's a simple commercial balancing act. Um, and that is why I think uh, novel advanced reactor technology in this time is a real opportunity rather than the challenge, it's flipping that language and that relationship to take advantage of the fact that we can look at novel ways of delivering security within SMR, AMR technologies to drive down the cost of security headcount uh, and thereby make it a more efficient commercial operation. Jeremy. Thanks, George. I think the, um, the other thing to add to this, um, I guess, would be the opportunity that the that is presented with these being new designs to integrate safety, security and safeguards and actually take credit for some of those other um, features so that you actually drive that cost efficiency and that operating cost out by removing the hazard in the first place. Um, some of the passive features. Great, thanks very much both. I think we're, we're almost out of time, but maybe I'll just ask uh, perhaps one question myself. It's a, something which came out of Alvaro's presentation when you showed uh, the different uh, IEA guidance documents, sort of winds guide in this area and how uh, they're being applied uh, to these new reactor technologies. Uh, I was wondering, and again, I'm, I'm slightly putting you on the um, on the spot here as I know you don't work for the, for the IEA in particular, uh, but I guess I was wondering if there was scope potentially for a new cross-cutting guidance document uh, across security, safety and safeguards, specifically looking at this technology, or is it more a case of applying existing guidance uh, documents that already exist from the security safety series uh, and so on. Um, but yeah, maybe if you have or anyone else that would, would like to comment on that. 
Yes, uh, thank you for the for the question. So as you said, I, I don't uh, work for the IAEA, but I'm aware that this is a working process that NSNS and the uh, uh, nuclear power, uh, nuclear energy department at the IAEA are, are working together to look at this. I know there has been some uh, meeting, particularly as I mentioned, for uh, how the milestone approach will impact the uh, deployment of SMR and how will this uh, affects recipient country that for the first time will embark uh, into uh, nuclear power. And there are also uh, considerations, uh, uh, not only for security, but as I said, also for um, safety and, uh, and, uh, and safeguards. And at the end, I mean, the, the, the aim is to do the process uh, more efficient and more, uh, uh, and, and in a more uh, um, uh, effective uh, 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 manner. We need to take into account that um, maybe a 10 to 15 year and three phases for uh, some country might not be uh, feasible if we're planning to deploy a micro reactor or uh, we're planning to deploy uh, an SMR that might not be used for power but might use for desalinization and in that case maybe an approach more similar to the one follow for research uh, reactor might be uh, more adequate but it's different. It's definitely a, a work uh, in progress uh, at the IAEA and also at organization like WINS. We are working with the support of, of, of some uh, our sponsors, some government, uh, to look at this uh, topic. Great. Thanks so much, Afar. I've just noticed that Duncan has his hand up, possibly on a previous question. Duncan. Yeah. No. It was just yeah, um, uh, it, 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 to to uh, to to uh, add a bit more context to the work on. Uh, the interface between safety, security, and safeguards. I mean, needless to say, the small module reactor uh, regulators forum, which is uh, part of the IEA, is is looking at that. In fact, it's the topic for the next couple of years. Now, um, it it just helps uh, regulators un understand um, the interplay between these, better understand it. Uh, should should uh, new entrants into the market um, come up with an engineering approach that really looks quite very different from the way that we've got established thinking uh, as regulators. Uh, and, and so it's not just a, an end in itself to say the three S's, it's, it's how, how it might help us um, understand um, these the new people into the market. We fully understand the, the the old players, your your Westinghouses and others. We we and they understand us. But I, I think it's uh, an important uh, uh, point that's been raised throughout the presentations about there are new players in the market. They don't necessarily understand regulatory approaches. They may not understand security, and they may approach it from an, a, an entirely different point of view. We have the flexibility as a regulator to look at that, but at the same time. No, there is relevant good practice out there. And if they don't use that relevant practice, which indeed academia and WINS and others are helping us understand, uh, then then that, that's probably, you know, it's not really meeting our expectations. So that was the only point I was going to make. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Duncan. So I think we're about five minutes over time or so. So we'll draw this session to a close. I'd like to thank all the speakers um, for sharing their remarks uh, on this topic. Clearly it's an area you know, where there's much more research uh, and development work to be done. And I think many of the organizations here are gonna continue with that. I'd also like to thank uh, Ollie and Bayes uh, for sponsoring uh, this side event and their continued support for the NSCP. And obviously thank all of you as well for turning up so early on a Monday morning. Uh, so with that, hope everyone has a good week uh, and I'm sure we'll speak to many of you uh, later in the week. Thanks very much.